Okay, so um, today was supposed to be an IA work day because some of y'all <clears throat> have turned nothing into me so far. Uh, and some of you have stuff to work on. Um, but uh, we're not doing that after the last mock. And so we're going to go over that instead. Uh, I think that might be a better use of our time. However, um, that does mean that I really do need you to work on your IAs over winter break. If you have not turned something in to me, I really need to see it. I'm not going to say by the end of winter break, because I know that like, you also need a break for winter break. Not maybe the whole time, you still need to work on your IA stuff, but I also don't want it to be that you're spending your president's day up till like 3 a.m. trying to finish your IA so that you can turn it into me the next day. Instead, I am gonna say that I need it by um, the next time we come back in person. So that's Tuesday, February 23rd, okay? So Tuesday, February 23rd, ideally I need to see, if I have not seen a draft of your IA, that is the very last day I will take it to look at your draft versus looking at your final IA. If you want feedback, that's the last day you can turn it in to me. Understood? Okay. Um, so once we come back, um, Sonia, Liz, Jacqueline, um, even though we're digital, they're gonna be teaching you about, um, I think it was some trig stuff, and then also what we did at the end of last year, which was sequences and series, the arithmetic and geometric. Yeah. It was pretty straightforward, but that's what they're gonna be reviewing. Um, they'll play their game on Friday, it's a Kahoot, so that works fine for digital, not a big adjustment. Um, when you come back in person that following Tuesday, we will have a class mock. On the calendar, I try to use paper two and paper one now to help you distinguish between the two. Um, I'm sorry if I, if that like threw y'all off. Um, I'm going to be totally honest and say that y'all are really weak without your calculators. So I was spending a lot of my time focusing on without a calculator because it was like, once they have their calculator, they'll be fine. Um, apparently you weren't. So um, we're going to try a little bit more with calculators as well. I'm going to try to talk about what to do without a calculator. Um, but this is the moment, I know I don't have the binders today, but this is why you might want to take your um, extra problems from that binder. They're broken into paper one and paper two. So you know what you need to work on. Do I need to focus on learning how to use my calculator or do I need to focus on how to do math without? Does that make sense? A, a piece of encouragement, a combination of both, but if you're in HL, you have one test without a calculator, that's a very important test. And oftentimes, in my opinion, the easier test. But you also have two other papers if you're in HL and both of those require calculator. So odds are a little bit more calculator practice is not gonna hurt you. But I feel like calculator practice is stuff that you should be able to figure out at home versus I can give you the tricks in class for the others. However, you'll see that the majority of the things left on the board are paper twos, meaning with your calculators. So after we review that little bit, we'll have um, a class like where we do it as a class. You'll take a mock just over the stuff that Sonia, Liz, and Jacqueline go over. And then after that, then you'll take a combined mock. So that means it will be over what you just talked about, plus calculus, plus statistics, okay? After that, I will be reviewing topic two. We'll play a game. We'll do a class mock of paper one, a mock of paper one. So you'll just be like without a calculator practicing the stuff um, for topic two. Topic two is like the quadratic linear exponential equations. So like basic algebra stuff. So I hope, fingers crossed. Um, we're not going to do a combined mock right then. I did change the schedule a little bit. I originally had a combined mock. Instead, we're just going to move into the rest of topic one, the stuff that hasn't been covered yet. We'll play a game. We'll do a class mock. You'll have a mock paper one over that. And then after that, you will basically have a shortened version of both paper one and paper two. That'll be your last, like, I think your last big summative. I think. Don't hold me to it, though. Okay, 
that'll be like for half the class, you'll have no calculator and the second half of the class, you'll have a calculator. Okay, over all of it. By, because by that point, we'll, we will have reviewed the whole syllabus. Then the week before spring break, I have compiled very difficult mock problems. You will be working in a group to solve those. Hopefully two days will be enough for you to figure them out together slash ask questions. Day one, I would prefer that you try not to ask me questions and instead try to figure it out on your own. If 30 minutes into class, your whole group is like, we seriously have nowhere else to go on this, I'll give you like starter pieces. Okay, you'll have all of spring break if you don't finish it to finish them. Now, ideally, I would hope that you could finish them before spring break so you don't have to worry about it, right? When you come back, you'll present your problems to the class. Um, I'm going to, I think, have y'all record them. Um, and the reason why is because I don't know that y'all will be able to teach your classmates fast enough in a whole class period. But on that note, if everybody watches these videos for class, we can have that day to have a fun day, okay? Like an easy day back from spring break. Then um, the following Wednesday, um, you have a mock paper one, full length, two hours. Like I've gotten permission from Senora and Madam Albright. Um, we're gonna be doing like into part of second period. Um, Miss, Miss Thompson. Yes. Uh, yes, I checked with Miss Kosilova too. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, it's because you weren't in front of my face. Um, after that, on Friday, you'll have a mock paper two, same premise. Um, that one will be with the calculator. After that, we'll be playing Jeopardy review games. All of that is still ID questions. Your last day with me before you start any of your testing, we'll be working on your formula. That's the layout of the rest of the semester. Um, I'm pretty sure that your IAs are due to me, sorry, are due to Notre Dame with my marks on them by March 22nd. I want y'all to try to appreciate that it takes me a while to grade them and grade them well. And the more time I take grading them, the less a moderator has to do. So if I mark them up like crazy and then submit that, it means that whatever grade I give you is probably the grade you're gonna get versus if I don't mark it up very much, it's more likely to be moderated down. So the longer I have to grade them, more likely that your grade is going to be the grade that I give you. Does so that make sense? So they're only returned any better. So I'm going to set a final due date for these. Um, I don't know when that final due date is, honest to goodness. Um, but we'll talk about that another day. Cool? Okay. All right. So now... On to this disaster of a test. Um, yeah. Okay, would y'all like me to go in order or do you like yes. Yes. all of the calculus problems and then all of the statistics problems? Um, yeah, I have a reference. Yeah, I can go. Yes. Okay. I think because y'all were coming from a non-calculator mindset, you forgot that you can use a calculator for probability. In fact, it's quite helpful. Um, but let's start with just reading the problem and figuring out what it's asking me. When it says the probability it will rain on any given day is 60%, during the next seven days, determine the probability that there will be more days when it rained than when it didn't. What is the last part of the sentence mean? What's up? Okay. Um, oh, I don't feel it. 
Oh, Here, I got it right. Okay. What does it mean when we say that the probability there will be more days when it rained than when it didn't? What has to be true? There, be four more days there has to be four, at least four. So at least four days of rain. Which means if I have the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm talking about when I say at least four, it means four or more, right? Uh, this is that box that I drew is the days that it rained, which means that I can also say at most three. three, no rain. I know I'm writing like kind of crazy over the lines, but I'm trying to do this for the people at home too. Sorry. Y'all can write this in a straight line. <laughs> Mr. Thompson, it's, it's completely okay. Well, I also have people who are absent, so I'm recording for them as well. Uh, okay. Not all about you, Joaquin. No, no. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry. You, you better be. Le Leonard, you were awake at 1 a.m. You should have gone to sleep. Dude, I was not awake. You texted me like 28 minutes after. Okay. If I have an inequality, meaning at least or at most, what kind of probability function am I using? CDF, C for cumulative. So I'm going to use in my calculator binome CDF. Now, most of your calculators with binome CDF, you want to use the at most. This is the thing that we spent like forever and a day on, where it was like, okay, if it says at most, if it's less than or equal to, then it's just binome CDF. If it's greater than or equal to, then you have to do one minus, and then you might have to do minus one to your n. And it was like a whole thing that we spent, like I swear, a whole week on. This one, if we rewrite the problem to be at most, we can just use binome CDF. So binome CDF, the first thing I need is the number of trials. How many trials do I have? Seven. seven, because there's seven days. Now, uh, remember, I'm looking at the red sentence. So I want at most three, no rain. So what's the probability that it is not going to rain? Not 40%. 40 percent, which is 0 0.4. The, the reason why is I have the probability it will rain is 60%. So the probability that it will not rain is 100 minus 60%, which is 40%. So lower bound is 0 0.4 and upper bound is 0 0.6. I think you're in CDF. I'm in CDF. No. It's just yeah. Um, in which case, your lower bound would be zero and your upper bound would be three. For the rest of you, it's just Three, I'm pretty sure. I could be wrong. Y'all might have zero comma three. Could you repeat what the that's just the number of times it's not gonna rain? Yes, the at most three. I just got my calculator back from someone who was borrowing it today, so I did not do this myself for the record. Which one do you press to go to buy them? Uh, second bars. Um, so when you type that in, you should get point 
710. Yes. Um, and here I did a different way, but I still get the same answer. Will I get like one third? Um, it depends. Um, I think you had. Um, I think you might. Um, I think I also didn't mark it because you do need to put a zero at the end of this. I know that's like really small. Yeah, I could do maybe. I think they might. I did say at the beginning while we were out of the room, I'm trying to grade these super duper harsh because there is an odd that like there is a chance that you won't get partial credit from a moderator. Um, depending on the year. Now, I would hope that this year of all years, they're going to grade kinder than they have in the past, but I can't guarantee that. Okay. All right. Everybody good on this one? The next question. This diagram shows two antennas. Each antenna is connected to the ground. Let X represent the distance between point P and the shorter antenna, which they give you a good picture, in my opinion. I think that's a great picture. We want to find the value of X that minimizes the total length of the cable needed. So the first thing I need to do is come up with a formula for the total length of the cable. Now, I'm going to break this into two pieces. There's the first part of the cable in red, and there's the second part of the cable in blue. Who can tell me how, in terms of X, I can represent the red cable? Go ahead, Nah. Um, it's going to be just to square. Um, so that, that red square will be equal to P squared plus X. This is Pythagorean theorem. This is the hypotenuse of a triangle. Right. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. I took the square root of A squared plus B squared because that just gives me C, the length. Does that make sense? Everybody good there? Okay, following a similar premise, who thinks they can come up with the formula for the blue side? Go ahead. Is it root 100 squared plus? This one's a little tricky. Y squared plus. It, it is another, let's, we can call it Y. Can be X minus 100 minus X. 100. Oh. Because the whole piece is 100 and the side piece under the red is x. So it's 100 minus x squared. Okay, so this is the formula for my length of the cable. You can then type this into your calculator into y1. After you type it into y1, you do second calc minimum. Arguably not even calculus. Once you have it typed into Y1, you do second count, which is a second table, and then minimum. 
And it'll say like left bound, so you move it to the left of the minimum and hit enter. And then it says right bound, and you move it to the right of the minimum. And then it says guess, and you put it over top of the minimum and you hit enter. Zero. Not showing on my computer window. Yeah, moving on as well. What? Oh, there. Did you guys get two point one? I'm at the graph part. So. Yeah, it's not showing on my graph. Yeah, you have to zoom in. It's like. When is it, is it, is it like 56.5 for one of the graphs? Also, is the x and l values that we have there supposed to be the coordinate of it? Yes. Okay. It is possible that the answer might be off. I'm going to. I'm going to 189 for y. Yeah, that's the answer. That's very well. We're at eight point four seven, and then one hundred eighty six point three. I just plugged the formula for the y one, and I looked at the table, and I looked where the y value is eleven. Yeah, I'm also getting the answer that the answers we got. You just typed in the equation. The square root of 50 squared plus x squared plus the square root of 100 squared plus x squared. Y'all are getting something else? Oh, wait, I, You're I, getting the same thing I'm getting. I might have looked the wrong value. You did say the minimum point, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I got a point at negative 33.2, but that's negative and not 0.3. Oh, yeah, I got 180. Okay. Uh, the minimum, but... I'm going to. If, if it, I know y'all are trying to figure out your calculators, can we come back to this one at the end even? Um, just so we can keep the video going. Um, but I got the right answer in my calculator. Andrew got it. I think Jacqueline just got it. So in theory, should work. So the answer was still 180? Yeah, 180 meters. Okay, this next one. Y'all, I was so disappointed in some of you. Um, when I say that the slide is the steepest, what does the steepest mean? What am I looking for? It has the greatest gradient. Yes, where the gradient or the slope is the highest. So I'm looking for the maximum of the gradient. M Ms. Thompson. The step is determine the function for the gradient. Ms. Thompson, I do have a question. Yes. For this one. Would we be looking for the great for the greatest negative gradient or the negative positive gradient? You're looking for the steepest, so it could be negative or positive, but considering your graph, it's going to be positive. Okay. Okay, here I have x, which is a function, being divided by 2 plus sine of x, which means I have to use Quotient rule for the derivative. Quotient rule. So that's VU prime minus UV prime. 
over b squared. All right, so we have b is 2 plus sine of x. Minus x times, what's the derivative of 2 plus sine of x? Cosine of x. All divided by 2 plus sine of x squared. Now, some of y'all did this thing where um, you tried to solve this. You don't need to. You just type this bad boy into your calculator into y1. That was and second half the maximum. Wait, just off, why would we need to put an x in front of the cosine? Because I have the equation right just for that part. Mm -hmm. um, so the formula is minus u v prime. So u is x. And then v prime is the derivative of v. Yep. Yep. Which, if I'm not mistaken, you should get 4.11 comma 3.49. Uh, and sorry, I should rephrase. There is another step. This 4.11 is what you get for the x value of when it's steepest. But they want the coordinates of the slide when it's steepest. So I plug 4.11 back into this equation in order to find the y coordinate. How did you get to 4.11? Uh, the box equation at the bottom into y1, second calc, maximum. Oh. The x coordinate should be 4.11, 4.10904. .10 okay. And the 3.49 is using plug it back into. Correct. Oh, I underestimated how long the question might run this one. Yeah, you did. Okay. Many of you did. This one is the radian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Radians. How did you know which one is radian and which one is radian? The rule of thumb, and it is very rarely wrong, oh, unless okay. they tell you degrees. The one exception is typically vector, vector theory and degrees. But everything else assume radians unless they tell you degrees. So this would be in radians? Yes. And so on the, the maximum point that you find, you just find the one that's on the, the quadrant one? Yes. Okay, I'm moving on. All right, next question. Probability. The lifetime of camera batteries are normally distributed with a mean of 10 hours and a standard deviation of 0 0.4 hours. When it says normally distributed, what function am I going to be using? Norm distribution. Norm. The norm CDF or norm PDF. So this is norm. Okay. Determine the probability a randomly chosen battery has a life, lifetime of less than nine hours. So the probability that X is less than nine. So you're gonna use norm CDF. Because it could be that it has one hour, two hours, three hours. So we have to include all of those probabilities. So we're using norm CDF.
So first you have your mean, which is 10, your standard deviation. Oh, wait. No, it's it's X first. Right? This is lower upper. Uh, so lower would be zero hours. Upper would be eight hours because we're not including nine. We want less than nine hours. Comma, uh, the mean, which is 10 and the standard deviation would be zero. I got 2.7 times 10 to negative seven. What is it like the lower bound negative nine nine nine? Like when is that? I think when it's it I think it would kind of be now, but like I don't know. <laughs> I do remember doing something. Yes, like it was like I I don't when I was taught, I was always taught to put negative nine 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 nine. But then other people I've learned since then teach zero because you can't have negative hours. But I think that throws a normal distribution curve off. So I'm not positive. So I'm going to test both options and tell you which one this one has. <laughs> So for A is it's point oh four. They got a different answer, but we did it right. What did they get? Zero point zero zero six two one. Wrong way on time. And then what did we what did what did you get? Um zero point zero 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 two eight seven. Okay, amazing. What did you try to do your calculator? I uh, well, I tried to go to like it like it didn't matter if it was zero or negative yeah. nine. So it wouldn't do the same. But you got the right answer with zero, eight, ten, and point four. Oh, I put nine. Okay, so I think I think that what I have on here is correct because it's chosen has a lifetime less than nine hours so it shouldn't include nine hours but i think the answer key did the same thing that sonia did and typed in nine we are correct so for the um the answer on my calculator it says um times e so that so that's like times 10 to the negative seven yeah, I know that, but which, which form um, you can write it as 2.87 times 10 to the negative seventh power if you want to what are we warning oh, you percentage? What are we warning you percentage? Probability. Okay, so it's ten point eight seven to negative negative seven is correct. No. Okay. The batteries are sold in packs of one hundred. A battery is consistently faulty if its lifetime is less than nine hours. Determine the probability that the pack contains at least one faulty battery. I'm going to pause and like change the first question and second question instead, if that's okay with y'all. Um, in that, I'm going to say instead of less than nine, we're going to say less than or equal to nine hours. And the same thing here, less than or equal to nine hours. That way we can use the answer that Sonia got. So it would be. The probability of x less than or equal to nine, which y'all just did it with eight, so it would just be zero to nine instead, which is equal to zero point zero zero six two one. And I'll, the, the reason why is we have to use that answer, and that's a much nicer answer to work with than the one we just got correctly, if that makes sense. So in this case, we have to find the probability that it's not faulty. So the above probability of less than or equal to nine in this case would be the probability that it is faulty. Make sense? So then the probability that it's not faulty is one minus that probability. Wait, it's literally it. 
which is equal to, no, that's not it, 0 0.99379. But then we have packs of 100. And I'm trying to find the probability that it contains at least one. So what I end up doing is one minus this probability to the 100th power. Okay, so since I'm determining the probability that it contains at least one faulty battery, um, P to the 100 is the probability. Yeah, but it's, it's the probability that every one is faulty. And then you do one minus that to find the probability that just one is faulty. Which ends up coming to zero point four six uh three six one five. So once you round it, uh it will be zero point four five or four six. Four six four. Three significant digits for IV. That's a One, at least one faulty battery. Yes. So, and then the 0.99 that we found. Yeah. That is the the probability that it's not faulty. That any battery is not faulty. Yes. Wait for part A of that question, but he didn't have. They didn't tell us how many it says it's average like during a lifetime like how come but like, usually it's like a boundary doesn't it? yes and we determine those boundaries from the section of it where it says a lifetime of less than nine hours but we reworded the question yeah. but yeah um this question i tossed out for everyone um because it's written wrong so now I'm so sorry that when you came up to me and asked me the question, I was like, I don't know why you're getting different boundaries. I didn't even look at the formula y equals x um, because I saw that line was y equals x plus 2. Oh. So that's why you were getting different answers was yes. because you were actually using y equals x. And I was like, why is she getting different numbers? Cool. Um, so if we were to do this problem, let's say it was actually correct, it would be y equals x plus 2. We should root you should add the plus two for the top. If we're finding the area of the shaded region, you're going to want to find the red region first and then add it to the blue region. Whenever we do areas, we're just doing integrals. So the red one, um, I'm going to call this y1 and y2, just for ease, so I don't have to rewrite the whole equation if that's okay with you all. Um, so the upper function in this case is y1 minus y2. And the boundaries where they intersect are from negative 2 to 0. Then I'm adding that to the blue area which would be from 0 to 2 of y2 minus y1. No? Maybe? Yes? That's what I was doing again the I. Yeah. Okay, the next question. I don't know how IB would score this certain trick that I'm about to tell you. Um, almost everyone got part A, um, which is when you have a normally distributed 
a normal distribution, these two pieces are the same size. So that means that A is 0 0.341. Cool. Could you show me one That's fine. Okay, from there, B and C should be the same number. So these two should be the same answer. You got one mark for writing down C the same as B. Even if your B was wrong, you get one mark for making it the same answer for the next part. Does that make sense? And you get one mark for E being the same as D. You get three marks if they were all the correct answer. Okay, so in order to figure out what B was, I sent my mu. Ooh, that's an ugly mu. My mu equal to zero and my standard deviation equal to one. Where mu is the center, so I chose zero and one standard deviation away. So when you plug those in, you should get for both B and C 0 0.136. Oh. Okay. Okay, so this is like norm normpedia norm. Like I chose values from you zero because it's a center, so that's like just a neutral number, and then one for my standard deviation because it's an easy standard deviation to figure out. They're just easier numbers. Um, Wait, you said one? Uh-huh. You want to Do we have an x value? Like, I also just know it because I know it. Like, it's a norm. It's a normal distribution, guys. I know. I know, like, there's it's a given thing. Yeah. But how did you find it? Like I just I, I just know them. I, I don't uh I can try to figure out how to figure it out, but like the, this is always the case for a normal distribution if it hasn't been altered. Like these are always the percentages. We like did this chart and then like divided it and it was like okay, 68% is in the middle, roughly 68%, but it's just a three digits. So I just know that it's 0 0.136. I think it's normal PDF. I think it is too. Oh. Oh, you can do anyone, anything. Wait, um, wait, why are you doing that? So let me answer these. Oh, we're done? What? Yeah, I'm glad you're doing I think is that CDF? I was about to say CDF because then you can make the lower boundary negative one and the upper boundary or the negative two and negative one. I'm gonna try that and tell you if I'm right. Hang on, sorry. Yes, I remember. I remember this. CDF. Oh, CDF. Yeah, so norm CDF, what I typed in is negative two, comma, negative one, comma, zero, comma, one. Meaning when I plugged in zero, this would be zero, negative one, and negative two. So from negative two to negative one is the C. So negative two to negative one, our mu is zero and our standard deviation is one. And then you should get 0.136. All right, lastly, uh, I think it did allow you to do this question two different ways. 
Um, I would do it the easiest way where I know that this entire probability is equal to one. Um, so when I did this, I did one minus two times 0 0.341 plus 0 0.136. And all of that divided by two. Are there two um, 0 0.136? Yes, B and C. Oh. Why do you have a oh, okay. oh never mind. Oh. So this part right here in green. Woo! This part right here in green. Two times all of that. So that says. 3.41 plus 1.346, so that's A plus C, and then I doubled it to be 3.41 plus B. Now the whole thing is one. So to find E and D, I did one minus that, and then to find just one of them, I divided it by two because I know they're both equal. So the answer you should have gotten is 0 0.02. Which they might have given you credit for that. I have no idea. I don't think so. Part of the problem is if you don't show any work, did you get 0 0.22? Yeah. That I think that is also an accepted answer, mm -hmm. but I think you would need to like say how you found it. I'm not sure though. I get any credit for guessing and getting 0.135. I think I considered it, but no. I was I was plugging the numbers because I remember the relationship. I just didn't remember the exact numbers, so I was just trying to plug in numbers to see if I would remember something. Uh huh. And it just, I got four. Did you memorize You should have that memorized. Okay, this one so funny. So many of you did not want to use quotient rule on the problem earlier, but on this one you did. Funny story, you don't use quotient rule on this one. No. This is not quotient rule because four is not a function. It's just a number. So I can rewrite this function. Ooh. I can rewrite this function as four times two minus cosine x raised to the negative first power. There's another rule that I'm supposed to use for this. Does anybody know what it is? What'd you say? It's not the product rule. Not two functions being multiplied together. This is chain rule. Chain rule is where we do the outside function first times the derivative of the inside. So I have four times two minus cosine x to the negative second power now. That's just the outside, but then I have to multiply times the derivative of the inside. So what's the derivative of two minus cosine x? Just sine x. Sine of x. So then to make it look pretty, I end up with four sine of x over two minus cosine x squared. They had an error in their answer key. Oh, no, they didn't. Um, you also have a negative here because the negative one comes down. So this is actually negative four. Sorry. Everybody okay? Sorry, I missed that set. Okay, from there. Um, Amazing thing, it says find where the ramp is the steepest on the interval from zero to pi. 
So I know I can set my window from zero to pi, and I'm looking for the maximum of this function. So I would type that function into y1 and find my maximum between zero and pi. Which y'all can do that now, or do you want me to just tell you the answer and you can try it later? Is that okay? I'm just gonna write the answer down. Um, I believe it should be 0 0.749. Uh, and then once you find that x coordinate, you're going to plug it back into the y, the original y function, in order to find your y coordinate, in which case it is 3.15. But you plug in the original equation, or do you have, or do you plug in the... Uh, First y1, you're typing in the derivative, because you're okay. trying to find the maximum steepest point. Once you find the x coordinate where that occurs, you need to find the y coordinate of the actual ramp. So you're plugging that answer that you get for the first part into the original. Okay, I'm moving on. In an election, based on the polls, it is expected that there is 60% chance that any given voter will vote for candidate A, a 40% chance they'll vote for Candidate B, there's 37 in total. So for the first question, calculate the probability that A will receive the most votes. In order to receive the most votes, how many, what is the smallest amount they would have to have? What? 19, wonderful, Andrew. So for part A, I need 19 votes for A. What's my trial here? What's my n? Wonderful. Okay, so in this case, what's easier to find, instead of saying, what's the probability that they get 19 or more? The easier way to think of this is what is the probability that B will get less than or equal to 18 votes? That one's easier to type into your calculator because you can do binom CDF. Thirty-seven, zero point four, which should come out to zero point eight nine two. Everybody good with that logic? How? It's more than half of 37. Half of 37 is 18.5. So in order to get more than half, you need 19 votes. Okay, part B. Um, very similar, but just a little bit extra thinking. Um, calculate the probability that after all the votes have been counted, A receives the most. Um, after counting 20 of the votes, candidate A has 11 and candidate B has 9. So what is the probability, like how many more would A need to win? Did you say 8? Yes. Yeah, that's right. So in order for that to be true, B can't get more than nine. Does that make sense? B could get at most nine votes. So now I'm going to do the same thing. The probability that B is less than or equal to nine. So that's Binom CDF of uh, uh, what's my number of trials this time? How'd you figure that out, Andrew? 37 minus 20, there's 17 left. 0 0.4 comma 9.
Move it on. This one tripped y'all up quite a bit. A lot of y'all started it, sort of, and got partial credit on it, some of you. Um, the first thing I need to do, um, can y'all tell me what kind of probability my end result is? What? What do you mean by end result? Um, the final question that they're asking. You broke it down into pieces, but what was the last formula that you should use? Is it the one that you put a point on? I don't know if I just wrote down the formula. Yeah, you wrote down the third formula. Conditional probability. There was a mark allocated if you recognized that it was conditional probability. If you wrote down the formula for conditional, you got a point. Okay. It's conditional because it says the first roll was a two and the second roll was a three. Meaning that there were conditions that one thing had to happen first and then the second thing happened. Conditional probability. So the first thing I need for conditional probability, can you read that formula that you wrote down, Dr. Um, probability of A bar B equals probability of A intersect B divided by probability of B. Um, this one's a little bit tricky. I will admit that off the bat. Um, because even if you recognize that it's conditional probability, you have to figure out what those conditions are. Um, so the condition that we're looking for, the probability of event A, it says the probability of A given B. Now, Joaquin, during the test, asked me questions. He said, does this mean they definitely roll the five? Do you remember that, Joaquin? Yes. Um, okay, so the thing that is given is that given they rolled a five. So B is the probability of rolling a five, like rolling the sum of five. And I heard Jacqueline during her test. She said that there's only two ways to do that, right? You could roll a one and a four or a two and a three. And that's exactly it. So we're going to find the probability of rolling a one and a four in any order and the probability of rolling a two and a three in any order. So the probability of rolling a one is one eighth, and the probability of rolling a four is one tenth. But I could also have this probability by rolling it a four first and then a one. So I multiply this probability times two. Does that make sense? If it helps you to think it out, you could write it one eighth times one tenth plus one tenth times one eighth. That's the same thing. Okay. So who thinks based off of this information they can tell me the probability of rolling a two and a three? Besides not. Because I'm really All right, go ahead, Jacqueline. One four times one three times two. Yep, perfect. Okay. Yeah, one four times one three times two. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So this is 140th, and this is 112th. Okay, so within my conditional probability formula, now I need to find the intercept between the probability of A. So the probability of A intersect B. What we end up with, the probability of the event is rolling a 2, then a 3. Okay, how did you get it? Um, that would be 1 over 24 times 2, which is 2 over 24, which is 1 over 24. Okay. Um, so, on the top, what I end up with is just 1 fourth times 1 six. A 2, then a 3. Divided by the probability 
of rolling a five. Which, when you type in your calculator, is 0 0.385. How much ability feel like walk time? Okay. Next one. This one somebody else started okay on. I will willingly admit real quick. Um, I kind of got in a zero frenzy. Um, I forgot to look at your graphs. So if you have a graph, you possibly could have gotten one more mark. But I think y'all will agree with me that since the highest score in the class was a 17 out of 74 that nobody deserved a 100. <laughs> and I don't think anybody's grade really got tanked by the marks that they got. But if you really want to come grade grub for a mark, you can have the mark back, but I don't think it's really deserves to change your grade. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so for this first one, sketching the graph, um, in order to get the marks, the three marks for the graph, there's three things that you need. The first thing is that your amplitude, meaning the height of the waves, had to decrease each time. There had to be approximately three cycles, meaning three waves, basically. And then the rough shape had to be correct. So this starts approximately down here. Smaller amplitude. Smaller amplitude. I still have a pitch. It's not great. I did that one. I take it back. Let me try that. Here. Okay, there we go. There we go. Closer. It's harder to do with my iPad, sorry. If you want to see my picture at the end of class, you can. But I have my amplitudes are getting smaller and smaller. The waves are getting further away from the x-axis. It's approximately the correct shape. And there are three maximums on the top. Okay, there's your picture. Um, so the next part, part B, finding the velocity function. Velocity is the derivative. I have two things being multiplied together that are both functions, which means I have to use Multiplied together, uh, product rule. So I need to use my product rule. So in this case, I have V of T would be equal to um, U V prime plus V U prime. So U is negative E to the negative 0 0.1 T times the derivative of cosine 2 T. Can anybody tell me what that would be? Um, negative negative, negative, two, negative two, two sine 2t because I have to do the derivative of 2t which is 2 so that's where the negative 2 on the back side comes from plus v cosine t times the derivative of u can you may tell me what that derivative will be What? 0 0.1 e to the negative 0 0.1 t. I get the two in cosine t. Here, cosine t. Uh, two t. Sorry. What was the exponent on top of the last e? Uh, it's the same exponent that's there. Uh, negative 0 0.1 t. Aren't you using the exponent one? Yes. So what is the no, 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 you don't because it's e. You, you're not, it's not power rule, you don't subtract one. The derivative of e to the u is e to the u du. Mm -hmm. um, okay, this can be simplified uh, to make it easier to type into your calculator which I think y'all will appreciate, but if you don't want to do it, you could type that whole message to your calculator if you wanted to. Um, but I see that both of these have an e to the negative 0.1t. So 
So I'm going to factor that out. So I'm left with 2 sine 2t two plus 0 0.1 cosine 2t. I think that's a lot easier to type into my calculator, a lot less parentheses. But if you don't want to risk making a math error, you can type in the whole ugly mess from before. The reason I need to type it into my calculator is part C says find the total distance the end of the spring travels in the first 10 seconds. If I'm finding distance from a velocity function, what am I calculating? How do I move from velocity to position? You take the, uh, uh, the integral. So instead, I'm going to integrate v of t from 0 to 10, the first 10 seconds. So in your calculator, you can type in v of t into y1, and then second calc, there's a button for integrals. And then it asks you for the lower boundary, you'd say 0, and the upper boundary, you'd say 10. So you mean like literally type in v of t? Like you type in this. Okay. And you should get 7.04 meters. It's also for the um the derivative you uh um, that you have in the box, does it have to be a negative key out in front? Um no. So what I did was I only pulled out the E, which means this negative was distributed here. So this negative two sine t became a positive two sine two t. This is not a negative e. What is it? Well, so you pulled out an e. Oh, okay, okay. The negative one multiplies over. Do you put the integral before or after? The function. You don't have to put the integral at all. Just type in the function. Oh, and then what do you do? And then you do second trace, which is calc. And then I think it's number seven in the like DDoS calculators. So that's the calc menu. And so you go down to the integral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to ask you for the lower boundary, you say zero. And the upper bound, you say 10. And then hit enter. Oh. You get 7.04. Oh, no. Oh, no. Good morning, number four. Shoot, not mass day. Is that how you transition? Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not mass, but it's a mass day. Okay. This one, I'm recording it. If you want to sit in here, you can. Um, but I'm recording it because it's the last question. I thought I had five minutes left. My dad does. Um, okay. So the first question um, is showing the probability. Sorry. No, it's not. The first question is calculating the probability still contains eight slices. Um, in this case, I have two pizza boxes. And what that means is that one of them is empty. One is empty and the rest still have eight slices, which means that every person that came into the room, the first eight people chose the same box. The probability that they choose one box is one half. Now, if you imagine a probability tree, that means that they chose the same box eight times. The probability each time is always one half. If I go one half eight times and I multiply it eight times, I have one half to the eighth power, which is equal to 1 over 256, which is equal to 0 0.00391, approximately. But I would have also taken 1 over 256. All right, part B. Um, I'm just going to take my time and explain this slowly. I'm going to pause this recording. Y'all need to go to class. This is going to take me too long for y'all to have to do it. Bye, Joaquin. Have a great rest of your day. Okay, so the second one asks to show the probability that it contains exactly three slices of pizza. So the first idea is that since it's the first person to discover an empty box, that means that the person before the person who discovers it had seven slices in that one box. So we're going to use our binomial distribution formula. So we have NCR. 
uh, times one half to a power times one half to a power times one half being our final person's choice between which box to choose. Okay, so that means that the person before there were seven slices taken from one box and there were five slices taken from another box because if there's three slices left when the last person comes. So the next to the last person is going to come and take a slice from this box, meaning that it's empty. That way the next person has negative five, but that's why our numbers are seven and five. So now when I fill in those pieces into my formula, I have seven here as my power, five here as my power, and then my NCR, um, my number of, um, my R here is five, and my N is 12 because five plus seven is 12. This is five, and this is 12, okay? So once you um, plug that into your calculator to figure out what that coefficient is and multiply it times those powers, you should end up getting 0 0.0967. So again, it's setting up the situation for the person before the first person to discover an empty box. So the same premise follows for part C where they ask you to find that for the most likely number of slices left in a box. So the same idea is that that first person still has to find it. So we're going to have k slices left. Um, and we're going to have to have seven taken away from one of the boxes. But we don't know how many slices are going to be left here. Hopefully, there's going to be k slices left. Um, so what we end up getting um, for our coefficient, it is 15 minus k. And the reason it isn't 16 is because we know there's at least one slice left. Um, so we have 15 minus k uh, because it's 7, not 8. Um, so 15 minus k um, is going to be 7 taken from the other one. That's the minimum. So then we have 1 half to the 7th times 1 half 8 minus k, which is the number in this box. 8 minus k slices left, uh, times 1 half the last person to choose from the box. Um, so here, you'd want to create a table. Um, so you can plug in different values for k to figure out what your table would be. So if k is 0, if k is 1, 2, 3, et cetera, so on and so forth, um, when you calculate your table, you should figure out that I believe it's one or two slices. It's somewhere in this range once you want to make your table. Um, so one of those three will be the most likely, meaning it's going to have the highest probability here. And I think two of them are the same. So one of those three is your final answer. So that should work. Thank you.